deliver this seminar for us. Um, I was trying to think how long I've known you for, though. I think it's probably around 10 years or so, isn't it? Um, and well, Sarah's done all kinds of research, actually. It's, it's really kind of difficult trying to characterise what you do because you've done so much diverse stuff. But let's just summarise a few brief things. You've done research into reading motivation. You've done research into mental toughness. You've done research into working memory as well, I seem to remember. That's correct, isn't it? Um, yes, yeah, it's a question of the search, that's right. But that really doesn't do justice to the breadth of research that you do, really, is it? Um, so <laughs> it's difficult to try and characterise it. But Sarah is based at the University of Edinburgh. And well, yeah, I'm just really delighted you come along. So the less I say, the better. I'll hand over to Sarah. Thank you. Oh, thanks, Dave. <laughs> Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Uh, one thing I will say is for the last um, year or so, I've decided that I'm going to narrow my focus of research. So I'm going to be doing focusing on literacy research from now on, um, and specifically research which involves collaborating um, with children, young people and teachers. And that's some of the work um, that I'll be talking about today. So I'm just going to share my screen. Um, I keep getting invited to other meetings. So I'm going to try not to go to those. Um, here we go. So I hope everyone can see this. Dave, can you just let me know? Can you see that OK? Yes, I can see that fine. Thank you, Sarah. Perfect. So today um, I'll be talking about co-designing um, educational um, interventions. I'll specifically be talking about different models of collaborative research, which involve working with children, young people, parents, teachers or other professionals. And in particular, some of the work from our LALCO group, um, and um, in particular, those studies which focus on co-designing uh, interventions. So why co-design? Um, I think the more co-design research that I'm doing, I think why not? Why haven't we been doing this uh, much earlier? Um, but I think one of the first things to point out is that this there's, a, there's this recognised disconnect between university-based research um, and practice. So in 2017, the National Foundation for Educational Research published a really interesting report and it asked teachers what sources of information they drew upon in order to support their classroom practices. And 67% of teachers said that they drew upon ideas generated by themselves or their school in order to support their classroom practice. But only 16% of teachers said that they drew upon um, academic research in order to um, uh, inform their practice. OK, so I think that's uh, uh, clear evidence that this is kind of disconnect between what we are doing in universities and the type of data and research that we're conducting and what how the extent to which that is be being applied and um, within the classroom. And so co-designing allows an opportunity to sort of bridge the gap between research and practice. It allows researchers and teachers to collaborate together and in doing so you're able to um, understand a bit more about how to make your research more relevant and meaningful um, for classroom practice. I think another great reason to co-design as well is that we as researchers actually have no classroom practice. And so by working with teachers, we're able to draw upon their professional pedagogical knowledge, expertise and experience. So you can synthesise what researchers know about theory and research and bring that together with the expertise that teachers have um, in classroom practice. So before I go on to talk about some of the projects, I thought it might be useful just to ground some of this in the academic literature at the moment. So in the last um, few years, there's been this growing interest in implementation science and translational science. So implementation science is the study of how evidence based programmes can be embedded in order to maximise successful outcomes. So we know that very often research informed interventions often fail to transfer successfully into real world educational contexts. And some of the reasons for this are to do with implementation, so they're just not feasible or practical, at least not to be sustained um, in any kind of long term. Whereas if you're working in collaboration with teachers, you can speak to them about these kind of implementation issues, you know, what's feasible, what's practical, what can be sustained once the researchers leave the school. OK, so working in this collaborative way allows you to understand obstacles to implementation and hopefully overcome some of these as well to ensure that the intervention that you're creating can be implemented um, and sustained given um, school resources. Translational science is something which is a little 
bit different, but it basically involves um, a kind of understanding of optimal ways to translate research findings into practice. So this isn't something that I'll be focusing too much on today because it's that kind of later stage of the process where you've already carried out the research, maybe just as a, a single research team, but you're looking at translating these findings um, into practice. And again, this is where teachers can come in as well, where you share your research with teachers, you ask them to reflect on it and think about what the implications may be um, for their classroom practice. Um, and I won't be talking about translational science today, but if anyone's interested, um, I do have an example of a translational science project from a few years ago, and I'd be more than happy to um, discuss that. Okay. So as I said at the beginning, um, all of the work that I'm going to be talking about today is um, from part of our LALCO lab. So LALCO stands for Language and Literacy Communication Collaboration Co-Production. Um, it was co-founded by um, Lynn Duncan from the University of Dundee and I in 2019. And LALCO aims to connect those working in research policy and practice in order to optimally support the language and literacy skills and experiences of children and young people. So at the moment, we have over 170 um, stakeholder members. We have also have an advisory group with um, members from Education Scotland and Scottish Book Trust um, sitting on that too. And what we aim to do is to bring together people who've got um, different types of experience, knowledge and influence, but who have a shared commitment, I suppose, to supporting um, children and young people's language and literacy skills. If you're interested in learning more about LALCO, there's a link to our um, website here and specifically um, details of all of our LALCO projects um, can, are here. And I'll be talking through some of these different projects um, today. So what are the aims of LALCO? Well, one aim is to develop, promote and share innovative and methodologically robust collaborative research practices. And that's what I hope to be able to do today is just to share some of the experiences that we've had of working in this way um, in case other researchers are maybe considering um, this approach. And there are three principles that underpin LALCO. The first is communication, so effective communication of research to research users and beneficiaries. So this sort of translational process that I'm talking about, where you have research and you've communicated in a meaningful and relevant way to teachers or to parents um, or to children, for example. And communication also reflects the sort of importance of improved communication between those working in um, research policy and practice. Collaboration is about individuals from research policy and practice working in partnership on research projects and activities which align with societal priorities. And all of the research grants that I've written over the last few years have always involved um, a research partner outside of academia, whether it's an organisation like Education Scotland, National Literacy Trust or Scottish Book Trust, or whether it's working in partnership um, with teachers, for example. And co-production is about the joint design of interdisciplinary research to generate together some knowledge and resources and also publications. And these publications um, can take different forms. So as I said today, what I hope to do is to talk through some of the different projects that we have running, which focus specifically on co-designing interventions. And I'm using the term intervention in quite a broad sense because all of our interventions are actually quite um, different. Um, and hopefully there'll be something that you'll be able to take from at least one of these projects. So the first project um, is called Sharing Stories. This is a project in collaboration with Glasgow Life. So Glasgow Life are a city who are sort of um, tasked with delivering um, learning, sporting and cultural activities on behalf of Glasgow City Council. Um, and prior to this project, um, Lynn and I had actually worked with Glasgow Life um, on a previous project. The aim of the Sharing Stories project is to support family language and literacy practices. Glasgow Life have identified in Glasgow um, specific literacy hotspots. These are air communities where they're hoping to target and provide additional support for families and language and literacy skills. And so the project's um, based around these literacy hotspots in Glasgow. In terms of how we developed the intervention, first of all, we had a discussion with Glasgow Life about their sort of priority areas. What were they hoping um, to focus on? And then Lynn and I created research informed presentations and activities, which we then shared, revised and agreed in collaboration with Glasgow Life, but also family support workers who are going to be working with the families as part of the intervention. In terms of what the intervention looked like, um, it was a series of 10 online sessions between family uh, support workers and families themselves. Originally, so this was prior to COVID, um, all the um, 
The intervention was meant to be delivered um, in libraries. So the project's funded by Carnegie UK Engaging Libraries Programme. If you're not familiar with that, it's about using libraries as spaces in order to um, share research with communities. So originally, um, all of the sessions were going to be delivered um, in libraries. Um, but Glasgow Life actually very successfully managed to get um, 40 digital devices and data and managed to send that out to families and give them training in order to get these sessions online um, and in their homes. Um, and the series of the 10 sessions looked different. We had um, the first session looked at early language and brain development, was Wayne's Brains. There was um, looking for clues at story time, which is about dialogic reading practices um, and helping parents with book choice. And then the final sessions were called um, Once Upon a Time in Glasgow, which looked at the importance of sort of creating stories um, with your children and the importance of stories feeling personally relevant um, to you as well. So the projects be, um, independently evaluated and um, that's required and um, by the funder but what we're hoping to do the sort of second phase of this is that once we've had the 40 or so families involved in this um, project we will then co-produce with them a resource that can be shared with other families in the communities in which they live as well so this is the sort of first stage of the process and as, as a result of enhancing their knowledge and understanding and confidence they will then work with us to create a resource and um, to share with others Okay. So the second um, project that I'm going to share is um, called Reading to Dogs. So this is a project led by my um, PhD, a PhD researcher, um, Jill Steele, um, and it's a project in collaboration um, with primary school um, students. So prior to COVID, um, there had been a sort of rise in the implementation and popularity of Reading to Dogs programmes across the UK. I mean, a really significant increase actually um, in their popularity. And yet a systematic review, which had been published a few years ago, said that there really wasn't, a, uh, there was a lack of robust research underpinning our understanding of the effectiveness of different types of Reading to Dogs programmes. But a lot of them did tend to focus more on sort of well-being outcomes um, and also aspects of reading effect as well. So how Reading to Dogs might increase children's reading attitudes, their reading confidence and reduce reading anxiety as well. And so what Jill did was she created um, and evaluated a Reading to Dogs intervention which was aiming to support children's well-being um, and their reading effect. In order to create the intervention, um, she worked in collaboration with um, three primary school teachers. These three primary school teachers all had um, specific expertise and experience in reading to dogs within their own schools. And they all had um, a role or responsibility in their school, specifically with well-being and or literacy. The intervention um, which resulted was a four week reading to dogs intervention called PAL or Pause and Learn. Unfortunately, because of COVID, it did have to be delivered online and so Jill switched all of the materials so that she could do it online um, instead. And if any of you are interested in how we evaluated um, the intervention, um, then there's a link here um, to um, the Open Science um, Framework. Okay, so the next um, project that I'm going to talk about is um, called Tackling the Drop-Off and um, Understanding the Teenage Reading Experience. And this is actually a project which came about as a result of a previous project in collaboration with the Scottish Book Trust. So our previous project was called Growing Up a Reader. Um, and as part of it, we actually trained 12 primary school children and 10 secondary school children at the university. So they came to the university for some research training and then they interviewed their peers about what it means to be a reader and just to learn about their different experiences and um, with reading different text types um, as well. Um, and after this project, Catherine Wilkinson at the Scottish Book Trust, who I work really closely with, her and I sat down and thought about what would be a good next step um, for, this, uh, for this work. And what Catherine said is that really what they wanted to do was to focus on teenage reading because we know that there's a real drop off in terms of teenagers having really low attitudes towards reading, not choosing to read um, frequently. Um, and so um, we decided to focus this project um, on the teenage reading experience. So the aim of the project is to encourage teenagers to read books for pleasure. Um, the method that we have, I think, of all the projects that we've been running, this is definitely the, the project with the highest level of input or collaboration um, from others. So the project's been led by PhD researcher um, Charlotte Weber, 
Um, and what Charlotte has spent the first year of her PhD doing is just really reading a lot about participatory research approaches. And she's going to be recruiting a youth advisory panel to work with her throughout the course of her PhD. They will help her to kind of develop the research project and ultimately the intervention as well. So in other projects, when we typically co-design with teachers, we often put specific parameters around our um, intervention. So we may make it of a specific duration. We may use a term like reading motivation in a very specific way. But with this project, Charlotte's really not putting any parameters around it. She's asking students how they would define their terms. What's the best way to communicate with their peers about different information and to get other students interested? And so the intervention may not look like an intervention in its traditional sense, where you have activities and resources. It may be something which is more sort of fluid, more peer to peer networks. The truth is, we actually don't know what it's going to look like because teenagers are going to have so much input into it. But I think that this is right, given the fact that we are focusing on teenagers and I don't think teenagers are going to respond as much to an intervention which has been created by teachers and researchers. I think we really have to involve them in it to understand more about their lives and their experiences and with reading. Again, we don't know how it's going to be evaluated, but we know that it will be mixed methods. Um, and I really strongly encourage anyone who's doing any intervention work to always carry out a mixed methods approach. So you're not just looking at measurable changes in outcomes. You're also looking at people's experiences, so teachers and children's experiences with the intervention as well, and asking teachers questions around implementation and feasibility and sustainability um, too. There's a couple of things that I want to point out about this project. So one is that it's funded by a ESRC and SGSSS and collaborative PhD studentship. So this was a supervisor led call. So Lynn and I wrote the application and when we wrote the application and um, it they specified that the PhD research would have to make an intellectual contribution towards the project. And so the actual application that we put in wasn't clearly defined about what exactly was going to happen. And so we're able to have this kind of very high level of participation in terms of the direction that the project will go in. I think traditionally, when you apply for research funding, sometimes you have to be very precise about what you're going to do. And that can be really difficult when you're co-designing um, in this way. Um, so yeah, just thinking about the way there's a sort of tension, I think, between wanting to have high levels of participation from others, but also understanding that when you're applying for funding, sometimes you do need to set specific parameters around what you're planning to do. I think another um, point that I wanted to make about this project is that in some ways it raises um, greater ethical considerations than other projects may do as well. So we said to the youth advisory panel approximately how many hours we'd like them to be involved in the project and over what duration, in what way we'll be communicating with them and what types of information we'll want as well. But actually, this is a project which may go off in different directions. Um, and so you need an ethics committee who are quite quick to respond to changes and um, more so than a, a sort of traditional research project where you've got a very clear idea about what you're doing and you stick um, to that idea. OK, so the next project, this is the final one and um, I'd like to talk about today is the Nuffield Love to Read project. And this project just started in September of this year. And the aim of the Love to Read project is to inspire and sustain a love of book reading. And we're specifically focusing um, on children aged 9 to 11 approximately. So the last three years um, of primary school. What we're hoping to, well, what we will be doing is sort of integrating what we know from theory and research about how to inspire and sustain a love of reading. We'll also be interviewing children and um, to learn more about their experiences and their ideas of practices to support um, reading motivation. And we'll be taking this knowledge and sharing it with teachers to go to sign um, an intervention. In terms of what the intervention will look like, um, it's going to be approximately um, six weeks long and we'll have research informed principles, um, which uh, we'll be sharing with teachers and then we'll be using their suggestions for classroom activities in order to embed these principles and um, in practice. Um, for this project and actually for all of our projects now we're trying to align these as much as possible with open science practices and so we'll be pre-registering our studies both qualitative and quantitative studies. We'll also be making all of our materials available as well so they'll be openly available our interview questions or um, questionnaires um, and then ultimately we'll be sharing um, all of our data um, too. So the project's being funded by the Nuffield Foundation. It's being led by Emily Oxley, who's our um, post 
uh, postdoctoral researcher and is in collaboration with Jesse Ricketts at Royal Holloway and Laura Shapiro in at Aston University. And this is also a project uh, funding application that we wrote in collaboration with Education Scotland, Scottish Book Trust, National Literacy Trust, and also two um, teachers as well, so Megan Dixon um, and Katrina Lucas. So what I thought I would do is just go through this project in a little bit more detail, just because this is the sort of biggest project that we have running at the moment, and just talk through the different phases and how we integrate um, other people's perspectives um, into the intervention. So in the first phase, we're sort of carrying out a literature review and um, looking at all the theory and research in this area in order to identify research informed principles to underpin the intervention. Um, Char uh, not so, uh, Emily will also be carrying out interviews with um, children from four UK schools to learn more about their experiences with reading, so both good and negative experiences as well, um, and also getting ideas from them about practices to promote reading for pleasure, what would encourage them and their peers um, to choose to read more. And we'll also be asking them about the intervention principles that we have and practices that could potentially embed those in practice. And then we'll be combining what we know from theory, research and children's insights to then um, create the intervention. So the intervention is going to be co-designed with six primary school teachers who will be recruited um, for the project and we'll have an open recruitment phase for this. Um, and there will be um, a series of six uh, online uh, design cycles. Um, where we'll be seeking in, independent and individual contributions and then coming together for a group discussion and decision making about which practices will be best um, for classrooms. And then following this, we have a feasibility study planned um, with six schools, so two probably in Edinburgh, two in Birmingham and two in London, where the other um, investigators are based. And it will be a mixed method study, so quantitative measures looking to see if there's any measurable changes in children's reading motivation and engagement as a result of the intervention, and also qualitative um, uh, data post-test as well, where we ask children about their experiences with the intervention, but we also ask teachers as well about their experiences um, and any issues with kind of implementation um, and sustaining it um, beyond uh, the project. So as I said at the beginning, what we hope to do as part of the Lalco Lab is to be able to share our own experiences of um, collaborating with others um, because we're aware that, at least if you're a psychologist, this is actually quite new to you. I'm aware that in other disciplines such as childhood studies, and um, they've got a much longer history and tradition of carrying out participatory research, but actually for psychologists, this is still quite new. And so I think it's really important that we share our experience so that we're able to improve um, on the methods that we use. So I think um, I've sort of set up these different stages. The first stage is, I suppose, responsibilities of the researcher, which you need prior to the sort of co-design process. And I think one of the first things is to carry out a sort of thorough review of the research literature, but being able to summarise that in a concise way for teachers in a way that's also going to be educationally relevant and meaningful for them as well. And there can be quite a lot of work involved in bringing together quite a big research literature and finding a way to succinctly and successfully um, share that with teachers. I think as well, um, and it does depend on different projects, but I think as well you need to have quite a clear framework in place of what you plan to do um, and often clear intervention parameters as well. Otherwise, you can spend a lot of time in discussion with teachers about how long is it going to be, you know, what will it look like, whereas I think sometimes it can be quite helpful to have an idea in mind about, okay, this is ex exactly what we're planning to focus on, this is the duration that we think we have the resources to do it for, what's the optimal way to use time within this specific time period. And I think another thing um, to take into account is that it's really important to understand the curriculum, policy and existing teacher focused guidance um, as well. So whenever I carry out any research now, I'll now look at the curriculum and um, that teachers are working within and see how my project links with the curriculum too. Um, and this is really useful because very often when you speak with teachers, they start referring to different aspects of the curriculum. And unless you know what they're talking about, it's really difficult to have meaningful discussions. And so I think as researchers, we do need to be a lot more familiar with the literature and the guidance and the resources that teachers are drawing upon just to have better discussions and understanding about where they're coming from. 
In terms of the next stage, I think um, in terms of selecting and recruiting the co-design team, I think it's important to have complementary yet unique skills, knowledge um, and experience. And you also want your co-design team to be representative as well. So for the Love to Weave project, for example, where we'll be recruiting six teachers, I don't necessarily want six of the most experienced teachers in this area because we may end up creating something which actually isn't accessible to other teachers who've got no experience in promoting reading for pleasure in the classroom. And so you need to make sure that you get that balance of experience and diversity um, among the, um, the team that you recruit. I also think it's really important to recognise the fact that teachers are really stretched at the moment and they've got limits on their time and their availability. And so you need to be as flexible as you possibly can um, in order to um, encourage teachers to get involved and to make this a uh, beneficial um, experience for them. And certainly I'll, I'll show you in the next slide with the Reading to Dogs one, the feedback that we get from teachers is that this is actually a really beneficial professional learning opportunity for them if they have the space and um, to do it. In terms of actually coming to the code design process, I think at the, at the beginning, especially if you don't have a lot of time, which often you don't, you need to ensure that everyone really has a shared understanding and a commitment to the project goals and the intervention. Um, and very often that's just about specifying exactly what the intervention is aiming to do so that teachers understand from the beginning what it is that they're going to be involved in. I think it can be helpful to have rules in place for co-design to ensure that the process maximises the team's expertise. So the approach that um, Jill used on the Reading to Dogs project, and we've used actually on another project that I won't be talking about today, um, and also the Love to Read project, is that we'll ask teachers to um, independently and individually submit ideas for activities. We'll collate all of that together, we'll share it with teachers, and then in the online meetings, we will be having a sort of decision making process about which activities are maybe going to be best. So that teachers have had some preparation and time to think about things before they come to the meeting. It's also important to recognise the intellectual contribution that teachers are going to be making to the project as well, and that they understand how their input is going to be used. Um, and maybe this is different if you're creating something which is commercial, but all the projects that we are creating, the interventions are going to be freely available. And I think as well it's worth recognising that there are also different approaches to co-design. So almost all of the co-design approaches that we planned had originally been planned to be in person and we had to move to online. And I think it's great because everyone knows how to work um, online and they're quite confident um, and able to do that now. And what it also means is that, is that we're able to access teachers who are more geographically dispersed than we maybe otherwise um, have. And also it's not such a high level of time commitment for teachers as well as they're sort of coming in and out of places. And um, so I definitely see some benefits of online and um, co-design, but um, some of the feedback that we've had from teachers as well is that it would be nice to just be able to meet in person. And I can imagine in some instances, it certainly would be better to be working round a table and um, in person on things. It's also important to think about the kind of blend of individual tasks of so what you want teachers to individually contribute versus a sort of group decision making process um, as well. And of course, there's different ways to learn from teachers. One of the ways is in the ways that I've um, said now, which is about teachers contribution via co-design. But of course, when teachers come to meetings um, to kind of reflect on their practice, it requires, I suppose, a certain level of self-awareness and self-reflection on what they're doing in the classroom. So I consider myself a teacher as well. I teach undergraduates and I teach postgraduate students. But if I was asked to come along to a meeting and to reflect on what I did well, I might actually find that quite difficult to do. In addition, if I was in a meeting like that, I might start suggesting really great ideas, but ideas that I knew I wouldn't actually have the time or energy to implement into practice. And so when you're co-designing, either online or in person, you're always at one step removed from classroom practice. And so another way to sort of draw upon teachers' um, pedagogical expertise is actually to carry out observations of teacher practices. So going to schools where you know teachers are um, giving very good practice in, for example, reading for pleasure and learning from practices in this more direct way, as opposed to asking teachers to come to meeting and to start reflect and to come up with ideas about what they might do. So this is just some of the feedback and um, from Jill's study um, on reading to dogs um, and I won't have spoken enough I think so I'll just give you time to um, read through what teachers had to say about how it supported their professional learning and their thoughts on co-design.
Okay, so just some kind of summary points. I think that there are different approaches to co-design educational interventions, and I'm not saying that today I've told you the right approaches or even the best approaches to do it. A lot of this is just learning from our own experiences. Um, and like I said, I'd be really interested to hear if any of you have been using similar approaches and would like to share um, any experiences with us. But I definitely think that there's different models that we can have um, and that we really need to be sharing our knowledge um, and experience of these different approaches too. Another thing to say is usually we just evaluate interventions once they've been carried out, but I also think we need to be evaluating the approaches that we use to co-design um, interventions too. So Jill, who carried out the Reading to the Dogs project, we have a paper um, which is just going um, through revisions at the moment, but we've kind of set out within that a three-phase framework to co-design um, interventions with teachers, drawing upon what was le learnt from um, Jill's um, project in particular. Um, but I think um, as a sort of research community, we really do need to be sharing um, our knowledge and experiences and um, with each other. OK, so that's me. This has kind of come to the end now. So it's opportunity um, for questions and discussion. And um, just to say the Love to Read project just started in September. If any of you are interested in learning more about the project, Emily Oxley, the postdoctoral researcher, um, is going to be um, sh sending out monthly newsletters, um, spe not specifically for teachers, but sort of aimed at teachers, but also researchers as well, as we sort of track the Love to Read project. Um, and so if you're interested in receiving these monthly newsletters, um, please just email uh, Emily. OK, thank you. I'll just stop sharing my screen now. Um, thank you so much, Sarah. That was fascinating. Um, and so many projects on the go all at the same time. <laughs> Um, there, there have been a few questions in the chat as we've gone along.